Yeah, I can't even tell you how awful it, it, that felt like to to be as ill as I was and to not be heard. And the other thing is like, it, at, at that point, it wasn't even just the doctors, but it was like family and friends and my coworkers. Everybody was treating me like, like I was, like I was just, I felt like people were treating me like I was crazy. The, the the first thing is that I started getting a rash on my lower legs and it was worse at night. And sometimes I would get like welts or bumps with it and sometimes not. And I didn't know what was going on. And I thought this is really strange. And why is nobody else in the house getting this if there's like insects or something? Um, but that went on for a while. Um, and then and then kind of eventually calmed down. But then the rash that I had had previously had started spreading. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. If I may, you, there, there's like a laundry list that I might just sort of rattle off here sure. in terms of what you experienced from 2018 through 2020, when you finally went to, um, the primary care provider, but right. um, so there's the unexplained itching, spotty rashes, daytime, hot flashes, neck pain, headaches, and migraines, fatigue, um, increasing fatigue. And then finally there was a lump under your left arm that I'm sure was quite concerning and yeah. you had a distended abdomen without any additional weight gain. And so July 17th, 2020, you go and you said, okay, I'm going to go see a doctor. You did. Can you describe what happened there? Yeah. So I went to, to, uh, the GP at the time that I had previously seen for the rashes and said, Hey, I found this lump under my arm. It didn't go away. Uh, and he said, okay, well, he, he felt that lump. He didn't examine me anywhere else. And he said, we'll send you for a mammogram and an X-ray and some blood tests. Um, and I had also, I had also gotten like really bad anxiety out of the blue at that point, which I, which I now know why and what it was. But, um, I also went on medical leave like that same day because I had gotten this anxiety to a point that like and fatigue that I didn't know what was going on so I started like a two-week medical leave then and then these tests were ordered and um so I went for the mammogram I went for an x-ray I went for the blood tests and everything was normal and when I went back to that doctor for the follow-up he he said to me yeah there's nothing wrong with you you must have you you must have just had an infection and uh I tried to tell him like, no, wait, there's more I'm concerned about like these rashes and, and things were starting to kind of like alarms go off. But anyway, he cut me off and he said, um, I can, I can tell that you're just one of those anxious patients who needs a little more coddling. And he, he shooed me out of his office before, uh, like without even letting me tell him about what the other concerns were. Um, so I left his office and like, my anxiety didn't go away. And I now know that that's a common symptom of, of, well, types of physical illness that your body is trying to communicate to your brain that something is going on and you get like anxiety as a result. Um, so that's what my anxiety was. And the, the more as it went through that I got told that I was just anxious, the worse my anxiety actually got because I was getting quite sick quite fast and nobody was really believing me, it felt like. Uh, so from there, I... I think I spent like about two weeks and I went on a short vacation on the Labor Day long weekend. And I said, okay, so I like I saw pictures of myself we had taken during that vacation. My abdomen didn't look right. And I just like, I just had a really foreboding feeling. So when I got home, I went to a different med medical clinic that a friend had recommended and I waited in line to see a different doctor. And I said, like, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make someone listen to me like to these other concerns. And so um, I saw the doctor that day, a, a new guy who turned out to be wonderful, um, like one of my biggest advocates. And he did an actual, like I told him about, I said, yes, I have some anxiety, but I also have all these physical symptoms. And, and this previous doctor didn't listen to me and like, I'm something's wrong. And so he did a physical exam and he said, well, you don't just have a swollen lymph node under your arm, like you have them all over. And his face looked alarmed. Um, and he like, he'd allowed me to tell him about the rashes and all the other stuff. And he said, okay, we'll, we'll order some additional blood tests that weren't done before. 
and they were for like autoimmune illness and different sorts of things. And then he said, I'm going to send you to urgent medical assessment. Just the juxtaposition between the first primary care provider and then this doctor with this walk-in clinic. I mean, can you just describe the difference and the impact it had on you? Yeah, like being cut off and silenced was was kind of scary. And of course, like a lot of people, including me, were intimidated by doctors and you think they, so I didn't know what to say to him, but you know, that feeling just didn't go away. And so I was like, I need to get a second opinion or someone else to, to, to hear me about these other things. And so when this other guy did, um, like, I, I just, I told him a bit about myself. I told him what I did for work, what I was doing in school. And, and, uh, and we had like some commonalities and he was just really, he was just really compassionate and he actually like listened and took the time to hear what I was saying and, 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 and do a physical besides just under my arm. And it was, um, it was, it was, it was something else to actually be, be heard. And of course he mentioned these different illnesses, Lyme disease and autoimmune stuff. And I said, but could it, could it be lymphoma? And he said, he said, well, that's worst case scenario. We get to check for, for these other things first. And I was like, okay. And then he said he'd, he'd call me later to follow up. And even that night after I went home, he called me on his cell phone from his car on his way home to see how I was doing. And he continued to follow up and text with me throughout to check on things. Blood tests were normal. Um, But he said, why don't you see this third doctor? Um, And I would love for you to explain that was about a week or so later, you you meet this third doctor. So yeah, mid September, I went to the, it's called the urgent medical assessment clinic at a hospital where I live to see an internist whose job it is to look at my symptoms and then try to figure out what's going on. And so I was, I went there to see him that day, mid September, I'm sitting in the room and he walks in and he's this huge man. And he said, hi, Ms. Kozak, do you, do you know why you're here? And I said, well, yes, I have like multiple swollen lymph nodes. And uh, so far I've had two rounds of blood tests, a mammogram and an x-ray, and we don't know why. And he looked at me and he said, he said, I don't believe you have swollen lymph nodes. Then I, then I was in shock because I thought it was his job to figure it out. So I told him, I said, come over here and feel them. If you don't believe me, come feel them. So I had to tell him to come feel where they were so that he would believe me. And then he did, and like, he was quite gruff. And he said, he said, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll order, we'll do these other blood tests. So more blood tests that hadn't been done. And he said, we'll do a CT scan, but he was, extremely gruff, extremely dismissive. And, you know, I feel like he was treating me like I was a hypochondriac or some kind of like hysterical woman. Like I thought, why is he, why is he talking to me like this when it's his, like, and why, and I'm like, I said, why would they send me here to waste your time if I don't have swollen lymph nodes? So that was bizarre and I can't explain it. And I, in fact, I still, I, I kind of want to write him a letter to just tell him, Hey, you had more symptoms you talk about, which we'll laundry list here too. lumps in your neck, feeling of choking pain, radiating from neck into collarbone, arms, elbows, and hands pain in your lower left chest, abdomen into your hip, burning heat in your knees, night sweats, right. radiating chest pain, shortness of breath heart palpitations and insomnia. So I just, I think it's important just to highlight what you had said, because it's like, these are not small random symptoms. These are, it's building evidence that this is something's going on. Right. And then, um, and then while I was waiting for that CT scan, actually, I was at work one day and I like, I got up from my, I had started getting this pain, like in my hip and I got up from my desk and I like fell to my knees and couldn't stand up because I had such bad pain in my hip. Um, and like, and, and I, my work had already seen me going through all these tests and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, something else is going on now. Like I need to go home and get it checked out. And I got home and I was like, I laid on the floor for a couple of hours because the pain was so bad. 
that I couldn't get up and I crawled into bed. And then first thing in the morning, I went to the clinic, which was the first doctor that I had seen um, about the lump. And he figured that I had shingles because when I woke up, I'd gotten a rash where the pain was. So I also got shingles and I'd never had that before. That was like September 29th. So yeah, all those other symptoms were like getting worse. And then I had the CT scan on October 4th. And again, like I came home from that appointment and I don't know what it was about the CT or the contrast, but um, my neck then flared up in a way that was even worse than it had been before. And I, and, and I'd actually had like this burning pain in my neck for a while, but I thought it was like back pain or something. Um, within a day or two, of getting that CT scan, the, the internist, Dr. T, who ordered it, phoned me. And he said that the, the radi radiologist who looked at the CT scan found, like phoned him before he even sent him to the report to say, you need to get this woman a, a, a biopsy for lymphoma protocol. And he wanted to biopsy um, lymph nodes in the left side of my neck. So that CT scan found enlarged lymph nodes in my neck and in my armpits and throughout my abdomen. And it said that I actually had what they call a conglomerate, like a large mass of um, lymph nodes in my, in my abdominal area and throughout. And so, well, that kind of explained my swollen stomach, right? <laughs> I mean, first, um, it's like so, such an interesting feeling, I'm sure, because you're hoping that you don't have something show up. But at That's the same right. time, you have been feeling all these things. Was it almost also a relief that there was an explanation for all these things that you were feeling? At least now they believe me that something's going on because they can see it on this image. And now, now they know, and they're going to have to figure out why. And of course, I was still hoping at that point, they said there was an autoimmune illness called I forget sarcoido sarcoidosis. And I was kind of like, please be sarcoidosis, right? because everything else, like then I'd had three sets of blood tests and everything was normal. And the, the x-ray and the mammogram normal. And then that CT was really the first thing that showed that showed definitively that something was amiss. But, but uh, even with that, which is what astounds me. I mean, so, so, so the radiologist would call the doctor that original one to say, we need to do a biopsy, make sure. And there's a lymphoma protocol that needs to be followed. Yeah. October 14th is when a core needle biopsy has been scheduled. And even with all of this, and you, you know, we all assume as patients that they're all talking to one, they all have the same data and information. You're walking into that appointment. The doctor who's supposed to do this biopsy then says what? He said that my lymph nodes were on the larger side, but in his opinion, not abnormal. And yeah, he told me that he didn't think that the biopsy, that the core needle biopsy was medically necessary. And he said, well, I could do it if you want, but I don't think it's necessary. And I've been doing this 30 years and I'm, I'm, uh, if it was me and that was my CT, I wouldn't do it. And then, so basically I was like, okay, great. So I didn't get the biopsy and I left and I wasn't sure if I had like done the right thing or not done the right thing. But that doctor was just really convincing that, that he thought it was medically unnecessary and didn't agree with them doing it. Okay. Okay. And so you, you leave there and there's like some sort of relief, I guess, cause no one wants to have a, a needle stuck in them like that. And so it was like, no. okay, well, if you're so sure, and you've been doing this for 30 years, I mean, why wouldn't you listen to him? Right. And so yeah. you, you leave. And then I guess that's not it though. Right. Because the original doctor then um, ends up saying, no, 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 we have to do this. So, so two things. So the, the, the lovely GP, the second one that saw me that had been texting me, he knew I had been going for the biopsy that day. And he actually texted me in the morning to say, Hey, I'm thinking of you. I hope it goes well. And he texted me in the evening to be like, how did it go? And so I texted back. I was like, actually, this is what happened. They didn't do it. And he got livid. He was like, what? And then I, I said, well, what should I do? And he said, you need to get a hold of the internist and tell him what happened. Like he's gonna find out anyway, but get a hold of the internist, tell him what happened and ask him to reschedule. So the next day I phoned the internist who had, who had 
ordered the biopsy on the recommendation of the pathologist or the, the radiologist who looked at the CT scan. So I phoned him and said, okay, well, so they, they didn't do the biopsy because they didn't think it was medically necessary. And he got angry and he got angry. Not he, what he said was, well, I don't want to get in trouble if there really is something wrong and we miss it. It wasn't like, I'm concerned with you as the patient. Like it really came across as like, yeah, I don't want to get medical malpractice. So we'll just send you, we'll send you. He said, I'm going to send you for a surgical biopsy. And then I said, well, wait, 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 like you make that appointment and get that referral done. But in the meantime, because he said it could be a wait. I said, in the meantime, while I'm waiting, can you send me back again for the biopsy? And this time I'll make them do it while I'm waiting. Cause may maybe that'll show up something that in the meantime that I won't have to have my neck cut open or whatever. Um, and see, so he said, okay, he'd refer me to the ENT surgeon, but, and while we were waiting, he'd send me back for the, the, an, another needle biopsy. So I went back to the same hospital on October 30th. So two weeks later, um, same hospital, um, different doctor doing the procedure. And this was a younger guy. And then he walked in the room and he said, Nadia, 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 why are you here? And I told him all my symptoms and blah, blah, blah. And he said, yeah, I, I he said, I, I read your report and I looked at the CT scan and I looked what the previous doctor had said, like that, that I went for the biopsy for. And he said, he said he agreed with the doctor that didn't do the biopsy two weeks previously, that it was medically unnecessary and they were barking up the wrong tree. And so he said, I know she's been having these symptoms, but um, I don't think her lymph nodes are that swollen. I, I, and he said that the mass that the CT scan saw in my abdomen or the conglomerate, he said he didn't think it was really a conglomerate, but that it was just that I, ha I don't have much abdominal fat so that the nodes are just really close together. So that's what he said. Uh, and then he even took me in the back to show me like his big screens with the CT and I got to see the inside of my body and stuff. And I was like, wow. And he showed me all the notes and he said, oh, these actually aren't that big or whatever. And I just said, well, okay, I know that you know that, but like the person that first saw my CT didn't even wait to write a report. He phoned the doctor and said, get her to have a biopsy. And I said, if you don't do this biopsy, they're going to cut my neck open. So like, can we please just do this first before I go to surgery under general anesthetic? Right. So he reluctantly did it because I basically said like, do it somehow. So, yeah. So somehow these two doctors that I don't know what they're called, but that perform the core needle biopsy took it upon themselves to look at my CT scan and say that they didn't think it was necessary when I don't think that that's even their job there. I think they're just supposed to do what, what was ordered. And so, so that second time I, I made them do it, I was getting more and more sick and it's like, I could feel myself going downhill pretty quickly. And when everybody was just kind of telling me that I was just anxious or that I was like treating me like I was just like a hypochondriac. It was, I mean, if you want to give somebody anxiety, that's a good way to do it actually. And the other thing is like, it, at, at that point, it wasn't even just the doctors, but it was like family and friends and my coworkers, everybody was treating me like, like I was, like, I was just I felt like people were treating me like I was crazy. And in a sense, I did feel crazy because all of a sudden all this stuff is going wrong. I can't do the things I used to do, like, like in terms of like functioning and I don't know what's going on and I know it's something and nobody's believing me. It was like the most alone I've ever felt in my entire life, actually, and the most terrifying. So um, I did have a counselor, luckily, throughout this. Um, um, that I was seeing. And I remember I would go in and see him every week and I'd say, so this is going on and that's going on. And he, um, he actually was a really big support in, in helping coach me how to talk to doctors. And he basically, he said, Nadia, look at this, like your job, it's your job to make them figure out what's going on. And so he, and he, yeah, he was awesome. So he, he was like my secret, my secret weapon that nobody knows about who just kind of kept coaching me to keep insisting. And 
And he believed me. <laughs> I mean, the value of someone just believing you, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think we can overstate it. It is incredibly important. I am so happy that you had someone, a counselor there to be in that role because everybody else was failing to do that. And he told me, he said, you know, he said a lot of people who are, who are, you know, who have some sort of mental health issue or having anxiety or whatever, he said, it's very, very common that they get written off by medical doctors. Like, like that happens anyway. Um, but, but if they think that you have anxiety already, it happens even more. For, for doctors. And I understand that a lot of, there are a lot of interactions. They probably do see a lot of people who are anxious and it does turn out to be nothing. But mm -hmm. the, the, the difference though, is there's a lot on the line for us as patients. So I think we get to take up that space, right? And, and yeah. at the very minimum, uh, there's a medical way of going about this. So for you, there That's was great. enough for a radiologist to say, hey, we need to do a biopsy. We need to investigate this. Yeah, it's like I went through these periods where even though they did find something, then it wasn't being taken seriously. And I, I guess that was confusing. And like, you're, you're like, I had, I, I don't know how to explain this, but like people who it's happened to will know that like, I had a voice inside of me that I've never experienced anything like that before, like screaming at me, some internal voice screaming at me to get help, like get help, get help now. And I just, like, I just knew. And so, so I just like, I had like this knowing, so I would try to push them to get something done. And then when they'd say, oh, we don't think that it's, that's what it is. Then I'd be relieved for a second. And then I'd go, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> there is something really wrong. And so, so after that, after that core needle biopsy um, came back that we needed to do, we needed to do a surgical one. Um, I guess I spent like all of November kind of waiting for an appointment um, and my symptoms were getting worse. Uh, and worse, like I'd started getting more night sweats and my throat was getting so sore, it was hard to swallow. And I couldn't handle having like, like, like something like this touch my neck and it would kind of shift around. Um, and then I had this rash that I had had that had been mostly confined to my upper body and, 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 and around my groin, but it was more minor and didn't, and, and not painful. It all of a sudden spread um, all over my butt and the tops of my leg and legs. And I got burning and, and, and quite itchy. And, you know, it was just like another thing that I felt like was wrong or, or falling apart. And so I called, I called the, the internist, Dr. T just to, to say, I said, like, I'm having all this neck pain. It's getting worse and worse. And he said, well, he said, you, he said, he said, I'm not a, he said, I'm not an ENT. You have an upper respiratory tract infection. You need to go, you need to go see a doctor for an upper respiratory tract infection. And I'm like, I don't have an upper respiratory tract infection. And then I'd phone and tell him like, like, I just, I kept phoning his office. I'd phone and be like, now I'm having night sweats. And then when I phoned him about the rash, he told me that uh, he wasn't a dermatologist and that I just needed to see a dermatologist. And I kept phoning because I'm here going, this is the guy who, when I first saw him said, he didn't believe that I had swollen lymph nodes and treated me, treated me like a hypochondriac. So, so I'm waiting and waiting for this appointment for the ENT while I'm getting sicker and sicker and more tired and exhausted. And I can barely take myself to work and all of these other things. And I just kept phoning him because I'm like, I have to like make him hurry up. Cause I really felt like I'm going to die if they don't figure this out. When I went to see that the ENT, he like felt my neck, felt the lymph nodes. He said, yeah, like definitely that's not normal. And, um, he told me, he told me what they were going to do for the biopsy. And he, he, he held up his hand like this. He said, I'm going to make a incision on your neck like this. And I was shocked because I didn't expect it to be so big. Um, and then he told me that there was a risk of facial paralysis or shoulder paralysis from the surgery, that that's not uncommon. Um, and he, anyway, he made a, <laughs> he's a nice man, but he made a face to me. He said, you could end up with racial paralysis like this, you know, and he made this weird face and I was just horrified. And, um, and, uh, 
I said, okay, well, we need to do this like really soon then. And I was terrified. And I even was asking him, I asked him, is this really necessary if I can get like paralysis and you got to make that big of a cut? And he said, it would be really ugly. He said, it would be a really ugly scar. I'm like, is it really necessary? Yeah. I said, do we have to? He said, you have to do this. And at the same time, he was like telling me all the, like, I know they have to have a medical disclaimer, but the way he was doing it, I was like, that's not a medical disclaimer. That's like a horror story. Yeah, making yeah. faces like you might talk like John Christian, who's like a former prime minister that had facial paralysis. He was doing that. And I was just like, well, so I cried. I went to my vehicle and cried and cried all the way home. Um, but they told me, they told me that, that they were, that was like the last day. It was like a Friday. And then their office was closed for two weeks for the holiday days and they said they were coming back on January 4th and that they would call me after the holidays um, with an appointment and that they hoped to get me in by the end of January. No, and I was barely functioning at that point. And of course, this is like, this is all happening during the pandemic too, right? So, so I'm at home and I'm talking to my family by video or whatever, but really, really quite, quite isolated and basically just terrified by myself in my apartment um, going, okay. And, and like, how can I make it to that surgery date? I mean, you've had so many of these anxiety, scanxiety, waiting for something moments, any guidance to other people on how you could, how you dealt with it, how you, how you were able to get through that. I have a sister that I'm pretty close to that. I, that I talked to a lot and she was really there for me and that helped, uh, and I, I saw, like, I was still seeing that counselor and that helped. Um, the other things that I would normally do to help myself cope with difficulty, like hula hooping is one of them so fun. I wasn't really able to do it much at that point because of the, the, the pain and the fatigue. So um, I just basically stayed connected with like the couple of people I had in my life that didn't think I was crazy and that were for believing me. Good. Yeah. I think people can really hear that. It's, it's about, we have limited energy and bandwidth, especially given the circumstances and you've got to do it for yourself, whatever that yeah. means you've yeah. got to do what's best for you. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you.